Hi, my name is Dan Kalowski. I'm here to talk to you a little bit about how we at Ampere Computing use Zephyr to help uh, power the sustainable cloud. And the idea of the sustainable cloud is really about uh, understanding how society needs more and more computation time and processing time and how we can cut down the amount of power and thermal that comes to. It gets measured mostly as a, uh, a concept of performance per watt that we talk about. Ampere believes we have a solution that will help with this. Uh, a little bit about who we are, we build an ARM-based SOC. We've got a couple of generations of it. Um, you can see a beautiful picture of it here from Patrick Kennedy at Serve the Home. Uh, we're available in many of the cloud service providers that you've got out there today, like Oracle Cloud, Google Cloud. And you might have also used our services on places where you didn't expect it. For example, the Zephyr CI today has an Ampere system in it. Uh, the Oregon State University's OSL Labs, Open Source Labs, uses a bunch of Ampere hardware. They house several dozen open source projects as well through that. Um, to give you a little idea, though, that is an Ampere 1 on the right. The size of that is about the size of a Raspberry Pi as whole piece. All right, so we're not looking at standard Zephyr devices. That is just the chip. That is not the motherboard and everything else. Um, so how does this help with the sustainable cloud? Well, we're going to try to talk to you about the Neoverse ARM's Neoverse design at about 1,600 kilometers per hour. It's going to be fast. On the top layer, there are all these pieces called application processors. These are ARM V8 or ARM V9 cores. Typically, there's about 64 of them in the standard design. They all get meshed together to work. And this provides you with the layer to go run on. Uh, and Peter said, that's kind of cool. We, we're going to take that idea and we're going to take those application processors and custom tune them a bit more for cloud-based uh, workloads. And uh, then we said, well, we actually think we could do a bit better on the core count. So the Ampere Ultra, we see 80 cores. Ampere Ultra Max, we see there's 128 cores. Ampere 1, 192 cores. And then this monstrosity mentioned just recently, the Ampere Aurora of 512 cores uh, that will be an air-cooled system for use in cloud, uh, cloud data centers. No water cooling necessary. I kind of want two of those to just do a dash J 1000 on every build I've got going on. No real reason other than that. Um, but none of this talks about where Zephyr is. So if you take a completely unrealistic look at this chip and say all these application processors are at the top layer, there's a mesh that's kind of a middle layer to communicate, down below are these two ARM v7 cores. And this is where you'll find Zephyr on these products. The, these two ARM v7 cores are actually what power up everything. Once you push power, the, the lights turn on, the fans spin up, the power management happens. They run and set up the entire world for everything in this place. And we build about, I think it's five currently today, different Zephyr applications that run on these. And arguably the most important one that we've got is the mask run. This gets built into the silicon and is typically six months to a year older than anything you've been working on at that time. It gets frozen in there. It becomes really difficult to update it. And that is why the mask room is probably our most challenging piece here. Uh, once it gets frozen, we have a need to make reproducible builds. And this is where some of this talk is going to go into how Zephyr's challenges go. Um, we have a frozen ROM that is what went into that silicon, and we want to be able to reproduce it because if we need an update, we actually have to do a bit-for-bit -bit update on top of it. We can't just flash the whole thing over. There's only small amounts that we can do. We can only do, you know, maybe five or six of these updates ever. Um, we also contain a rolling ROM, and this is where our current list of bug fixes and changes go in. And we, again, maintain a backwards compatibility saying, not compatible, backwards check to make sure we are still uh, reproducible to the last ROM. Changes come in, we want to be notified about them and know about them right away. Uh, but all of this is made pretty easy because Zephyr's developers, the build systems especially, thank you, uh, have a very nice setup for making reproducible builds. The Zephyr developers themselves have taken a ton of time into carefully maintaining modules so that they do continue to allow reproducibility. I think the worst I've seen has been the little FS and the Zephyr developers have done a great job at, a, 
abstracting away many of the pieces that make it non-reproducible. But it still has a few little gotchas, right? One of them is the choice of language, C. This isn't me advocating for another language, but C has some challenges with it, and they are pretty well documented. So as you work on it, you just have to know those. Device tree, it's extremely powerful. It's extremely functional, and people love it or they hate it. It's also extremely seductive to use it wrongly. In many cases where you feel like you are using it correctly, you find out later that you did it wrong. Um, it doesn't help for reproducible builds. And then software versions. And this is something I thought we fixed in 3.6, but I see in 3.7 it's not there again, so hopefully 3.7.1 will get it. On the, it mostly affects the LTS, what versions of dependency software were utilized. We'd like to make sure you can reproduce that build and that, uh, that release at any given time. So for us, most of our failures for our reproducible builds, 99% of them come in as poor kconfig encapsulation, Somebody got creative with device tree. They tried to Jackson Pollock it and make it all kinds of inventive. Or, you know, in the C preprocessor use, incorrect. There have been two that showed up for us that were really interesting, and I want to share these because they were non-obvious ones for us, and they took us a while to debug here. And it starts with the ROM reports, specifically the hidden line. We got a flag in some of our CI saying, hey, the ROM isn't reproducible. Something changed. We look through the usual pieces, the standard bits of things like, oh, the kconfigs are correct, the, the device trees all still look the same, but there's a binary change that came through and we didn't understand why. And the section that gave it away was this hidden. When you talk to the ROM report owner maintainer for Zephyr, what's in hidden? The answer is, I don't know. It's stuff that we don't know how to categorize. And when you start poking into it, they're right. There, there's stuff that you can't really categorize. Now, I want you to keep in mind as we walk through this, this is a mask ROM. We have it set to build with optimiz optimization zero. We cannot have the compiler relocating code. So behaviors of the compiler are a little different when you're at optimization zero than they are with O1 or OS or anything else, right? And these were all found with Zephyr 2.x. They still persist today with the Zephyr 3.x. Uh, I can't say for certain on 3.7 because we haven't updated onto that yet but they are still in 3.7. So the first one is the non-obvious. Log debug, as far as I'm concerned, shouldn't show up in a build if it's not enabled. The strip version, we found that there are two ways that it does show up. The strip version is when you use none of the print K qualifiers. If you use a print K qualifier, it does show up in an O0 build. You can see it in the strings on the file or in the final build. Why? Again, we're back to the fact that an order or optimization zero has different priorities and functions that happen. Um, this has caused us to change some of our development processes saying, if it needs to be a log debug, you may as well make it a log info and make sure it's not something that's gonna change. We have people scraping UART output to make sure these strings don't change. The, the other one is this kind of quick one, uh, the is enable macro. We tend not to like the preprocessor version, we like the the uh, compile time, uh, the non-preprocessor version. Why can't I think of the term? Anyways, as an example, let's say you have a function called chip describe dump details. You just, it goes through a device, dumps a bunch of details about the chip. It doesn't really matter what. And you just safely assume that if in your main code you did an if is enabled and turned it off here at the bottom and said, okay, that shouldn't show up. Turns out that's not always true. In fact, most of the time it's not true. Uh, the solution we found with this is two, two variations on it. And one is to uh, put an is enabled within the function itself or wrap the function, the strings to be need, needed within the is enabled. And of course, you want to maintain the check at the main point because that'll be the extra four bytes of a uh, function call at that point. Um, and those are the bits of it. We're, since this is a short 10-minute talk, I'm going to call it there and say... Thank you.